purity and righteousness before God. Now, ladies, I, I know you must be thinking that it doesn't seem quite fair that you are the ones that have to do all the hard work cleaning house and the man gets all the ceremonial glory by declaring it clean. Well, ladies, you have your very own bit of ceremonial glory, which is called the brachut haner, the lighting of the festival candles. And this actually ushers in the celebration of the Passover. At this time, the mom will take this book, which we call Haggadah. Haggadah is a Hebrew word. It means the story or the telling. And within this beautifully bound and, and beautifully illustrated book, you have all of the story and the ceremony and the prayers associated with the observance of Passover. So mom takes the Haggadah and she reads a special prayer from it as she lights the Passover candles. Baruch Melech HaOlam, Asher Shel Pesach. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by thy commandments and commanded us to light the lights of Passover. Amen. Now I think it's appropriate that it is the woman rather than the man who lights the candles and so brings light to the festival table because in the same way it was not through a man but rather through a woman and the will of God that the light of the world came into the world. As the prophet Isaiah declared, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of my people Israel. And at this time, our Passover celebration can begin. Passover is observed largely in the home, around the family dinner table. And you'll notice pillows on the chairs at the dinner table. And this is simply because in the first story of Passover, as we read in Exodus 12, God commanded the children of Israel to eat standing, loins girded, shoes on our feet, and staves in our hands. We had to be ready to take off at a moment's notice. And in ancient Near Eastern culture, only free people could recline at the meal. Slaves always had to stand. Once we were slaves, now we are free. And so to symbolize that freedom, we recline on pillows. The father is especially appointed to lead his family in worship, and so he wears this special ceremonial garment called a kittle, which is the same garment worn by the priest in the temple when he ministered there. Of course, the father is high priest of his home, and he also wears this mitre, which symbolizes a crown from the ancient Near East. He is priest of his family and king of his castle. Appropriately attired, he leads his family in worship. And the Passover is not only a time for mothers and for fathers, it's especially a time for the children. And the kids are invited to participate in a number of different ways, but most significantly through the chanting of the Manishtana, or four questions which are asked of the father. And the father answers the child and then explains through that the meaning of the Passover for his family. Now, being the boy, the youngest boy in my family growing up in Boston, Massachusetts, it was always my honor to pronounce these questions. And here's what the first couple sound like. Which means, why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat leavened bread, but tonight we eat only unleavened bread. And after chanting all four questions, the father then answers the child and so leads his family in worship at the Passover. Now, not only are there four questions for Passover, there are also four cups. Actually, each of us has one cup as we sit at the table, but you see, we drink from that cup four different times throughout the Passover. It kind of serves as an outline for the celebration. And each time we drink from the cup, it has a different name and symbolism given to it. And the first cup is called Kiddush, which means sanctification, because with this cup, we sanctify all that follows in our Passover observance. Now, there's a traditional Hebrew prayer we say over this cup. And certainly, our Lord Jesus said that prayer. And then he said something afterward which directly relates to that Hebrew prayer. Baruch HaTadonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pri Amen. 
Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And then Jesus said, It is with great desire that I have desired to eat this Passover with you. But I tell you truly, I will not partake of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus spoke of a new or perhaps a fulfilled Passover in the kingdom. And with this cup, he sanctified all that was to follow in his own special Passover there in the upper room. Everything in Passover is now blessed and sanctified. And everything has a particular order to it as well. Seder is the Hebrew word for order. The Passover is referred to as a Seder meal. And this is a Seder plate. And despite its appearance, it's not for deviled eggs. <laughs> you notice the six compartments on the Seder plate? Well, they correspond to the six different items displayed down through here. And a little bit of each of these items is placed on the Seder plate. And the first that we have is carpus, which is Hebrew for greens. And the rabbis tell us that the greens represent life. And we will take some salt water, which represents the tears of life. And we dip the greens into the salt water. And so we are reminded that during our slavery in Egypt, our lives were immersed in tears. For truly, a life without redemption is a life immersed in tears. But we also remember that God redeemed us with a mighty and outstretched arm. He brought us out of bondage through the Red Sea and into freedom. And so by his mercy and grace, our lives have been drawn from tears. We eat the greens together now to remind us that we can now partake of life redeemed from tears by the mercy and grace of Almighty God. The next item on the Seder plate, whew, horseradish. We call it Jewish Dristan. <laughs> Guaranteed to unclog the sinus passages in the back of your head. <laughs> Now the horseradish, or maror, as we say in Hebrew, is the bitter herb that we read about in Exodus 12. And what we do is we take some of this bitter herb, the unleavened bread with it, and we take the bread, dipping it into the maror. We get about a teaspoon of it on there like this, and then I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but you know what happens when you eat this much horseradish? You begin to cry. <laughs> You have very little choice in the matter. It's a battle between the horseradish and your sinuses, and the horseradish always wins. But you see, the tears that we then shed, they become a graphic reminder to us of the tears our forefathers shed during their slavery in Egypt. And you might remember when Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples, he had said to them, one of you is going to betray me. And the disciples got all upset. They said, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? And Jesus said, he who dips in the sop with me that night, every one will betray me. Well, the interesting thing is that every one of the disciples would have dipped in the sop with Jesus that night. No wonder they were so upset. But then later we find our Lord himself taking the bread and dipping it himself into the sop and handing it to Judas Iscariot. He said to him, what you must do, go and do quickly. And the Bible tells us that when Judas took the bread with the sop, Satan entered into him and he went out into the night. Maror is bitterness and tears.